I, I would like to talk to you today, today about some of the main group uh, work that we're doing in my group at the University of Virginia. Um, but before I get started, I would, of course, like to thank Chemical and Engineering News for this uh, amazing honor. Um, I would also like to congratulate the, the other um, awardees. But I, I noticed in the issue, there was this part on undiscovered reactivity. And I kind of want to build on that for my talk to kind of demonstrate how really fundamental advances can lead to really interesting applications. Um, so in my group, we study main group chemistry, mostly focused on uh, unusual elements in the S and P block. Uh, it's not that we don't do any transition metals, but the core of our program is certainly in main group chemistry. And uh, main group has been the subject of recent um, special issues in inorganic chemistry and organometallics. And stay tuned for the special issue this year in organometallics uh, that I have the pleasure of guest editing on, on the, it's an update on the organometallic chemistry of the main group elements. So in terms of the work that we do in my group, you've already heard a lot of information about catalysis and, and developing redox cycles, low valent, low coordinate molecules. And we do all of that as it relates to subvalent and cationic nictinity. So those are group 15 compounds. We've also done quite a bit of work in that area as it relates to the alkaline earth metals. More recently, we've been studying carbon dioxide reduction as it relates to using these carbene ligands as mediators. Um, but I kind of want to talk about something different today because uh, many people know that we are working on that type of chemistry. Most folks don't know that we are doing main group materials type work for energy conversion. So I'd like to give a little bit of detail on that type of work uh, that we've been working on. So um, we've been trying to make thermochromic materials and those are materials that change color due to a change in temperature. Many people will be familiar with different types of paints for cars and things of that nature. You'll see cars that change color based on the weather. There are some of those uh, type cars. There are more playful items like spoons for kids. There are baby bottles that change color, for example, when it's okay for the kid to consume the liquid substance. There are thermochromic mugs. There have also been discussions about thermochromic uh, materials and dyes being useful for uniforms for soldiers. So instead of having to carry around a uniform that has uh, multiple uniforms, various colors, you can have one uniform that adapts to the different terrains. For example, the desert versus being in a jungle. So those are the types of applications of thermochromic materials that we're interested in. Um, to the to tell you a little bit about the types of compounds we make, I need to mention a little bit about the, uh, the chemistry behind it. So we've been making organoboron cations in my lab. So based on the coordination number of the boron center, we give them different names. And we've been mostly interested in boronian type cations. So about 15 years ago, there was a review by Warren Pierce, and there's a quote from that review that I'll read. Boron cations are elusive and highly electrophilic species that play a key role in the chemistry of boron. Despite early interest in the chemistry of boron cations, until recently they have largely remained chemical curiosities. So at that time, people were really just happy to isolate these molecules. They were interested in them for their fundamental chemistry. Uh, and some people thought that they were so electrophilic that they could not be isolated. So I'll show you how far we've come in a relatively short period of time. Now that these, we know that these compounds are very useful for catalysis, and I'll demonstrate the types of materials relevant projects that we're working on. So skipping some of the synthetic methods, we can make boron cations that are encapsulated in a heterocycle. So my group does a lot of X-ray crystallography to look at the bonding in detail for these types of molecules. So we can make five membered rings. We have also been able to make the seven member ring analogs, and these have various electronic properties. But I'll demonstrate the application that I think is very useful for these molecules at this point. So if you look at the structure on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see uh, a tricoordinate boron center that is cationic. That particular compound is red at room temperature. But when you start to cool it, it will change color to colorless, the same molecule. And that's because you have this intermolecular oxygen boron interaction going on and that process is completely reversible okay if you do the same reaction uh, in a different solvent you see a bit of solvo solvatochromism going on 
and you can go from orange to colorless. And again, that process is reversible. And to my knowledge, this is the first thermochromate beryllium ion. So that is quite a significant advance, in my opinion, going from compounds that one thought you couldn't isolate. Um, we've been able to develop a range of these types of compounds now. We can make uh, boropens, borofluorines. We can make radical species. So radicals are interesting for materials chemists for charge transport and storage applications. We can even dope these molecules with other heteroatoms, so not just boron. We can make boron phosphorus type materials, and that is demonstrated on the, in the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So we're making a range of these compounds now that really originated from just the fundamental interest for real applications. And that is demonstrated in the next slide for what I think is the next big thing for our group, and these results will come out over the next year or so. We've been able to now make thermoluminescent beryllium ions, and we're working on their optoelectronic and device applications. So you can see on the screen is one beryllium ion. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see that if, at different temperatures, they uh, are diff give different fluorescent properties. Also in the solid state, it looks very different. So you can see the blue fluorescent compound in the second picture. And these give high quantum yields, up to 80% or so. And also, depending on how we drop cast these compounds and make thin films, they also show different properties. And that's because this is really dependent on the molecular packing of these materials. So this is uh, something that we were working on right before we had to shut down because of the coronavirus. And we're now working on incorporating these into devices with colleagues in chemical engineering at UVA, uh, the Geary and Choi groups. So this is... Uh, one of the areas that I think, uh, you know, this chemistry will have a huge impact in the, in the development of OLED type technology moving forward. We're also in my group working on uh, boron dope pi electron type materials. So these are conjugated systems, which we link uh, by molecules like pyrene, and then we link to borocyclic fragments. Depending on the structural properties, the twisting of these molecules in solution can also give different properties. Um, and we've been able to extend this not only to pyrene-based systems, but also to benzene-fused analogs. But you can see the beautiful luminescent properties that we can elicit from these molecules. And we're now being able to um, develop, you know, tunability among these systems as well. Um, so what's next from main group chemistry in general? Uh, main group chemists have always been able to develop interesting structures, unusual molecules, push the boundaries of bonding concepts. But I really think moving forward, it's going to be our goal to really understand the impact of uh, chemical structure on the function of these molecules. This is going to impact chemical synthesis, redox active main group molecules, ca catalyst design, optical properties. And I think moving forward, it's going to have a huge impact on the development of new electronics. Before I end, I have to thank um, collaborators that have really advanced this science, advanced our program, uh, made me a better, better scientist. Um, I won't name folks, but there's been a really uh, large team that has pushed this chemistry forward. Um, I'd like to thank probably the most important people in terms of getting the work done, and my research group has really been fantastic. It has been a pleasure working with them uh, over the last two and a half to three years. Um, this chemistry, I didn't talk much about it, but the synthetic work is extremely difficult and it takes talent and hands to do that. And these folks have really worked hard. Um, I'd also like to thank some key mentors that have really supported me over the years, especially in the last several years. Rhett Smith, John Protosavage, and Hanser Grismacher also made contributions to the Talented 12 issue. So I really thank them for their guidance. I really taking my experiences from my undergraduate, graduate, postdoc work and meshed it into some really new chemistry. So I'm really excited about moving forward. I'll be happy to answer your questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, those beryllium materials are so beautiful. I wonder, are there, you know, and you've presented a lot of different colors. Are there any colors that are like challenging to make or that you can't make? Uh, yes, yeah, so the more redshifted materials are definitely more challenging to make than uh, blue materials. And But this is something that we're working on, uh, trying to incorporate a bit of design capability. Because on the front end, it's kind of difficult for us at this time to predict 
what colors we're going to get for these types of beryllium ions. And that's just because there's so few um, that give these properties so far. So that's definitely what we're going to be looking into moving forward. And you mentioned you have a collaboration with the chemical engineering department there at UVA. Um, right. Can, I mean, can you talk at all about those applications or are they top secret? Yeah, so some of the compounds, the beryllium ions that you saw are being incorporated into LEDs at this point. Um, so we're working on that with the Choi and Geary groups at, and UV Chemical Engineering. And yeah, that's about all I can say about that so far, but we're working on that. That just started right before the we were shut down due to the virus. And in the chat, someone asks if the beryllium compounds are water or protic solvent sensitive. Yeah, so uh, both. So some of them are sensitive, and but the really advanced that I think uh, I'm really excited about reporting very soon is that we've started to make air stable ones, and I think that's really important for future applications. That's that was the next question. Someone asked if they were how air sensitive they were. Yeah, the more recent ones are. We have not reported results on that yet, but we will be. So when you see the colors, is it just a total surprise or is there any predictive nature in that? You know, when structural changes we make that are similar to other compounds, of course, we, we can predict those. But um, just because there's so little literature on the types of beryllium ions that emit these types of colors, it, it is kind of a surprise until we can get the structure. Well, that must be sort of delightful in your lab. Yeah. Do, do your students come, come to you and say, look what I made, it's, it's lovely. Yes, and I, I, it doesn't even take them. Anytime I see any colors, they know that a chemical structure or some beautiful colors is one way to get me out of the office and in the lab to see what's going on. So that is a, <laughs> a nice aspect. All right, well, thank you for thank the wonderful you. talk. I really appreciate it.